Hello, my name is Justin Shiat. I'm a fish biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, my main office is out of the Alpena Fish and Wildlife Conservation Office, but we have a substation down in Detroit, Michigan. So out of our substation, we do a lot of work in southern Lake Huron, the St. Clair Detroit River System, and the western basin of Lake Erie. Uh, so today, I get to talk to you about the Maumee River Lake Sturgeon Restoration Program. Um, there are a lot of different people who could be giving this presentation. Uh, so thanks for allowing me to talk to you about this uh, project today. I was told to provide a picture of myself in the upper right hand corner of the video. So uh, this is me and you'll see uh, my picture in each one of the slides that are coming up. All right, so I mentioned already that there's a lot of different partners involved in this project and here's a list of some of the individuals that are involved in all of the different agencies um, who basically make the Maumee River Lake Sturgeon Restoration Program happen. You know, each one of these agencies has a unique role in this project and, and throughout this presentation today, I'm not even going to talk about all aspects of the project, more kind of the high level uh, parts of the, the project, how we got here, and uh, some of the interesting uh, biological results or assessment results that we've had over the last couple of years since this program uh, began. So to get started, I'm going to talk about uh, the historical lake sturgeon population in Lake Erie. So it was estimated that there were 19 different spawning populations of lake sturgeon in Lake Erie and all of these yellow stars on this map basically were historic or estimated historic populations. Um, in a paper published by Haxton et al. in 2014, it was estimated that the Lake St. Clair in Lake Erie contained anywhere from 300,000 to 1.1 million adult lake sturgeon and um, that would make Lake St. Clair and Lake Erie, uh, the, the lake or the area with the highest abundance of lake sturgeon in the Great Lakes. So now, through a lot of the work that's been done over the past couple of decades, we, we know that um, the, the Lake Erie lake sturgeon population is primarily supported by two different areas. Uh, one area on the far west side of Lake Erie, and that's the St. Clair Detroit River system. And then one on the far eastern side of Lake Erie, and that's the upper Niagara River. So it's estimated right now that there's about 30,000 lake sturgeon that are inhabiting the St. Clair Detroit River system, and about 1,000 lake sturgeon inhabiting um, the Upper Niagara River, or use the Upper Niagara River for spawning. So those are the two areas where we believe lake sturgeon recruitment is currently taking place, and none of the other populations, all those stars that I showed on that map uh, on the previous slide, are believed to contain self-sustaining or functional uh, spawning populations of lake sturgeon right now. So one of the questions that's often been asked regarding lake sturgeon restoration uh, throughout the Great Lakes and especially in relation to the St. Clair Detroit River system is whether or not that large population in the St. Clair Detroit River system is going to serve as a source population to colonize other historical tributaries either in Lake Huron or Lake Erie. So uh, luckily we have uh, a long-term acoustic telemetry project led by uh, Dr. Daryl Hondorp with the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, where we're able to help answer, answer that question. So each one of these yellow points on this map here basically represents a stationary acoustic receiver. Uh, these are managed by GLATOS in the Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observation System. So what we did was uh, the project that I was describing, the Acoustic Telemetry Project, a total of 282 adult lake sturgeon that received acoustic tags in the St. Clair Detroit River system between 2011 and 2014. And 76 of those fish 
were tagged in the Detroit River. And as you can see on this map here, out of a total of 76 acoustically tagged adult sturgeon, 22 of them were detected at some point in Lake Erie. I should point out that these tags are about a 10-year tag life, so there's a lot of, of time um, that we're able to obtain movement uh, information on these fish. So the kind of the main point here is that 20 detected in Lake Erie. So what we were also able to do is take a look at whether or not any of those fish that, those 22 fish that were detected in Lake Erie, did any of them go up historical lake sturgeon spawning areas. So i get my pointer out here. So each one of these stars right here is um, a historical lake sturgeon tributary in the western basin of Lake Erie. And this is the Huron River, Raisin River, Maumee River, and Sandusky River. Uh, at each one of these historic tributaries, we had um, acoustic receivers at the mouths of the tributaries. And over the time period, up until uh, 2017 anyway, there were no lake sturgeon that were acoustically tagged. We're so as a result of that acoustic telemetry work, uh, preliminary results indicate that recolonization of historical tributaries in Lake Erie due to straying from the St. Clair Detroit River System population may be a, so a slow process. Therefore, supplemental stocking may be necessary to achieve restoration targets over uh, shorter time scales in tributaries that can support a reintroduction. And that is what I'm basically going to be talking to you about today is uh, restoring a lake sturgeon population into a tributary that can support reintroduction. All right, so a little bit about uh, the, the Maumee River project, getting into the details here a little bit more. So in the fall of 2013, there was a meeting at the Ottawa National Wildlife Refuge between the Ohio DNR, Toledo Zoo, Fish and Wildlife Service, and the Lake Erie Water uh, Keeper. And the group wanted to embark on a project that would raise awareness about the Lake Erie watershed and current problems within this area of concern. One of the potential projects that came to mind uh, was, or that was, that was brought up uh, by Sandy Bin with the Lake Erie Waterkeeper was a project to potentially rear lake sturgeon in, in the Maumee River with annual outreach events that would promote aquatic stewardship within this watershed. So that was kind of the, the start of getting the group together and, and, and um, talking about a sturgeon restoration project. In, th in the winter of 2014, there was a meeting at the Toledo Zoo by the Ohio DNR, uh, the Toledo Zoo staff and Fish and Wildlife Service, and we began discussing the potential of, of stream Another thing that, that kind of came up during this time was, was the process of how we would go about um, determining whether or not um, the Maumee River was suitable for lake sturgeon restoration and then what are the steps that would be needed in order to develop a, a restoration program? So this uh, schematic here is um, taken from some of these um, points here are taken from the Lake Sturgeon Genetic Stocking Guidelines on whether or not a restoration project should move forward. And other ones um, were just developed as a part of this process. So prior to stocking, we first need to figure out whether or not there is an existing population of lake sturgeon or whether the uh, river, the candidate restoration tributary had a historical popu population. Uh, we need to identify the habitat constraints, uh, develop a restoration plan, and then construct a rearing facility. That would obviously all have to take place uh, prior to, to stocking any fish. So I'm gonna get into each one of these um, aspects of this process in a, in a little bit of detail here. So historically, the Maumee River did support a population. Uh, Smith and Snell in 1891 reported an early decrease of sturgeons in the Maumee River, where sturgeon once ran up the river by the hundreds as far as the rapids above Perrysburg, 
but at present, in 1885, they're no longer there. Um, in a document put together by Holy et al. in 2000 uh, from Lake Sturgeon researchers around the Great Lakes and in uh, the state of Michigan and Ohio, the Maumee River was, was considered extirpated or Lake Sturgeon were no longer present there. Um, the current population status, so uh, Jim Bowes in 2006 and 7 um, conducted Lake Sturgeon spawning assessments using egg mats, gill nets, and set lines. So the egg mats were used to document any spawning that could be taken place and then gill nets and set lines um, to document any adult sturgeon returning to the Maumee River. No eggs or, or lake sturgeon were captured. And then there's also uh, been quite a bit of work done by the University of Toledo with larval drift and egg mat surveys and no lake sturgeon larvae or eggs have been detected. In addition to a lot of other surveys that have been conducted, um, there have been lake sturgeon that have been detected in the Maumee River every once in a while, but based off of this information, we considered the Maumee River uh, lake sturgeon population functionally extirpated. There might be a stray fish that goes up there once in a while, but there's not a spawning uh, population uh, that existed or that currently exists. All right, so we can check off that first checkbox there, whether or not there was an existing or, or historical population. There was a historical population to the best of uh, um, before restoration could begin, the second process in the, was to define the current habitat suitability. So um, there was a graduate student hired at the University of Toledo, Jessica Collier, to determine the amount of spawning and age zero rearing habitat that was funded by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And the whole goal there was to determine current habitat suitability at all life stages the spawning, whether or not there was enough spawning habitat and nursery and juvenile habitat for lake sturgeon to, to currently survive. In addition to uh, the habitat suitability work, the Ohio DNR also said that they would like to have a restoration plan developed outlining the details of the project. So in the restoration plan, obviously there would be restoration goals, uh, the biology and historical status of the population, the current habitat conditions, doing some habitat suitability modeling, uh, stocking considerations, uh, what would be success, public education and outreach, regulation and enforcement, and long-term management. So those are all aspects that are currently in uh, the Maumee River Lake Sturgeon Plan. So this is a little bit more detail about the habitat suitability model that Jessica Collier uh, created for the Maumee River. Uh, mainly focusing on spawning adult and age zero lake sturgeon, so that spawning and nursery habitat. So the information that was input into the habitat suitability model included uh, bottom substrate, what type of uh, material was on the river bottom throughout the river, uh, water depth, water velocity, water temperature, and all of that information would be used to create the total spawning area or total amount of nursery habitat for each life stage, either age zero or uh, spawning uh, fish. So this next slide here is a map of the habitat suitability model results. The top map or layer that you see there is for the spawning adult uh, habitat suitability information. And as you can see, uh, the good habitat for spawning adults was about 7.7% of the river or about 156 hectares of good spawning habitat. So that was kind of the first step for us to be like, all right, there is spawning habitat that is available in this system. And then the bottom map is the amount of nursery habitat. And as you can see there, the um, amount of good nursery habitat is about 26% of the river or 529 hectares. And on each one of these maps here, um, red is poor, yellow is moderate, and then green is indicated as, as good 
in regards to habitat suitability. So this information was taken from Jessica's uh, PhD dissertation. So uh, I have my contact information at the end of this presentation. And if anybody would like me to share that uh, dissertation uh, with you, um, I can do that. All right, I'm just going to focus on a couple things in the restoration plan. Uh, Jessica also uh, developed and wrote the restoration plan with input from uh, the State of Ohio and Fish and Wildlife uh, Service. Um, so I'm just going to touch on a couple aspects of the plan. So uh, as far as stocking goes, uh, the goal is to annually stock 3,000 fingerlings into the Maumee River, 15 from a streamside rearing facility that's ran and operated by the, the Toledo Zoo, and 1,500 from the Genoa National Fish Hatchery. So the main reason to stock fish from two different stocking sources was to try to compare return rates into the future. So um, one of uh, kind of the default approach for, for lake sturgeon stocking in the Great Lakes uh, has been to use streamside rearing facilities in rearing those fish in the water that um, we hope that they return to in order to increase imprinting or, or chances of, of returning. Um, so we wanted to develop a study uh, to assess whether or not adult return rates would be higher for streamside reared fish or for those fish reared at a, at a traditional hatchery. So that's, that's why we have two different stocking sources. So the donor population would come from the St. Clair River or Southern Lake Huron. It's genetic stocking unit one in the genetic stocking guidelines developed by uh, Welsh et al. 2010. And the goal would be to, uh, I guess I should, I should step back. The, the reason we chose to use the St. Clair River Southern Lake Huron population is because it was uh, determined that this is likely the same genetic population that would have been present in the Maumee River if a population still uh, existed, trying to match those genetics as, as close as we could possible there. So the goal is to, is to raise eggs from seven females and cross them with 21 males each year, so a, a one to four crossing. Um, however, during each year, we try to collect 10 females and 40 males. That's how many we target because uh, in some years, the females might not release their eggs. So we shoot for a little bit higher than our goal in hopes of achieving our goal of, of seven females and 28 males each year. So uh, each year, the, the, these fish are housed at uh, Purdy Fisheries, a commercial fish company in Sarnia, Ontario. And they've been a, a great partner uh, on this work. So uh, I kind of already touched on this a little bit, but the goal is to collect seven females and 28 males each year. Uh, priority will be taken on fish that were captured on set lines. Um, and I already mentioned that just in case they're, they're hat, there's low hatch success, um, we collect 10, 10 females. And, and the reason we choose seven and 28 is because in the genetic stocking guidelines, that document that I already mentioned, if we achieve the, that number each year, um, the uh, minimum viable population uh, genetically will be, will be maximized or will be um, uh, achieved according to that document. So that's why we chose seven females and 28 males. We didn't just kind of pull those uh, numbers out of thin air. All right, kind of checking off the different uh, boxes to this restoration process here. Um, we identified if there was any habitat constraints through the work that uh, Jessica did with the habitat suitability model. Um, also developed a, a restoration plan. The restoration plan um, was also approved by the Great Lakes Fish Commission uh, Lake Erie Committee. And so the next step was to construct a rearing facility. So um, the Toledo Zoo, as I mentioned, operates and runs the, the streamside rearing facility. It's constructed from a, a 3.1 meter by 12.2 meter cargo trailer. There's egg incubating jars, 10 rearing tanks. Um, and on the picture of uh, the picture on the right here kind of shows the inside of the streamside 
rearing facility. I'll get into the rearing facility a little bit more in this presentation, but um, all of the rearing process, um, that could be a full presentation in itself. I just wanted to say that here. This, this presentation is more focused on the process and how we got there and what's going on, but there are certain aspects of this presentation that could be broken down. So if you want more details, uh, Dr. Uh, Matt Cross at the Toledo Zoo, I have his contact information at the end of this presentation and you can reach out to him regarding the rearing facility uh, design and uh, that, that process. All right, so here is a, uh, some, of the, some of the, is the goal ultimately of the restoration plan and some of the objectives we have complete and then objectives that we have to um, do each year, basically. So the goal is to create a self-sustaining adult lake sturgeon population of 1,500 adults, and we think that'll take about 25 years of stocking to do that. Um, we determined that the Maumee River can support a lake sturgeon population through the habitat suitability model work. A restoration plan was developed and funding. This was kind of uh, obviously for many of the programs that we work on. This was a big, um, this took a lot of time. Um, we received uh, $90,000 in funding from the Great Lakes Fish and Wildlife Restoration through a, a grant that we received. Um, we also um, received $80,000 in U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service funds to construct the rearing facility and to um, provide some money for some of the infrastructure components of the rearing facility at the zoo. But with these funds, a rearing facility was constructed. And now ongoing every year, you know, we hope to stock 3,000 fish, hope to evaluate imprinting, do some biological monitoring, and have a large education and outreach. So um, we kind of, I've already gone through the, the steps, the pre-stocking steps, and now I'm going to talk briefly about lake sturgeon gamete egg collections and rearing, but um, just I'm going to go through these slides really quick. Uh, if anybody has any questions about egg collections, they can contact myself. I have my contact information at the end of the, the presentation, and the rearing, I would suggest contacting uh, uh, Matt, Matt Cross. All right, so this is one of those um, sections in the process that I said could be an entirely, uh, an entire presentation on itself. So there are quite a few different permits that we have to get every year in order to conduct this work. Uh, we need to get a CITES permit, an endangered species permit from the Ministry of Natural Resources, Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, and an endangered species permit from the Michigan DNR. Um, we have the fish collection component. You know, we actually go out and collect fish on set lines, and we also work with uh, the commercial fishermen, Purdy Fisheries, um, to supplement any lake sturgeon if we are low on the number of fish that we have from our set lines. There's a fish handling and hormone injection component. We determine, uh, we go out and collect, try to collect females that are in in ripe condition or that are ready to spawn. However, it's kind of hard to tell because oftentimes they're not releasing eggs. So we'll have to perform a progesterone assay, which is basically an egg maturation assay. It just assay, sorry. It um, just tells us how mature the eggs are in the female. After we perform that assay, we either keep that female or release her back into the waters of the, of the St. Clair River. On all the females that we know are um, um, ready, the eggs are mature, we have to inject one of those females with a common carp pituitary hormone in order for that female to release the eggs. And then we have gamete collection day, which is led by the Genoa National Fish Hatchery with a lot of help. We have help from the Ontario Ministry of Natural Resources, um, other members of our office within the US Fish and Wildlife Service, the University of Windsor, Zoo. So uh, quickly on fish collection, that takes place in the end of May to mid-June. These fish are captured on set lines and commercial trap nets, and I had to throw in uh, one of the ways, or really the, the only way that we determine the sex of the fish that we're keeping um, for, for our brood source is through ultrasound. So the picture on the left 
is an image of us collecting an ultrasound image from a fish and then a, the picture on the right is what a black egg female or a spawning ready female looks like. So lake sturgeon aren't sexually dimorphic. We can't tell by looking at them. We either have to push on their abdomen and see if eggs come out. Um, really doesn't happen for females that often, but um, milt is often expressed by the male, so they're a little bit uh, easy to tell. All fish are held at uh, two large raceways at Purdy Fisheries in Sarnia, Ontario. And here's an image of the raceways. And uh, this is the hatchery manager on the right there, Doug Aloisi from Genoa National Fish Hatchery. Um, doing uh, some of the egg collection uh, process that you can see. Uh, we also have uh, the University of Windsor on hand with a mobile uh, lab. It's a, it's a mobile trailer that they can tow around with them. And they are on hand to get a visual estimation of uh, milt or sperm motility. And there, there could be sometimes when maybe the sperm from a male isn't quite suitable enough for spawning, so uh, they're on hand to make, make sure that the, um, the milt is um, of high enough quality to make sure we have good uh, egg fertilization. All right, another whole presentation I could talk about is egg, larval, and juvenile rearing. Um, if you're interested in this, I would again talk to uh, Dr. Matt Cross at the Toledo Zoo, but you know, this is a really unique project. Uh, there are other sturgeon restoration programs that are going on in the, in the Great Lakes, but there aren't any other sturgeon restoration projects that are comparing streamside reared fish, fish that are reared as eggs, larvae, and juvenile in Maumee River water, and that's the rearing facility at the Toledo Zoo, and comparing that with the traditional hatchery like at the Genoa National Fish Hatchery. Unfortunately, we won't get data return rate data for probably maybe starting 10, 12 years into this project. Um, but that is one of the long-term goals to compare adult return rates and see if um, return rates differ between these two sources because it's, it's a, a lot cheaper to raise fish at the Genoa National Fish Hatchery than at the Toledo Zoo, um, at the streamside re rearing facility, I should say, just because of additional uh, staff time and some of the um, unique aspects of, of streamside rearing. All right, so I checked off lake sturgeon gamete egg collections and rearing there. The next part of the project I wanted to talk about was uh, the Maumee River fingerling telemetry project. So we have many different ways that we're trying to assess whether or not um, the, the Maumee River Lake Sturgeon Restoration Program is successful. So there's a large biological assessment evaluation project. And in one of those projects um, that we're currently um, embarking on is evaluating survival, habitat use, and movement patterns of the stocked fish and comparing the stocking strategies to inform uh, the, the restoration plan or the restoration goal. So the objective of this work is to assess survival using acoustic telemetry, evaluate habitat use and movement patterns, and then compare between those two stocking sources. So, uh, so far in 2018 and 2019, we implanted um, 40 fish each year. So, so far we have 80 individual fish tagged half from each of the, the different stocking strategies. The tags that were implanted into these um, fingerling lake sturgeon were um, Vemco V7 tags and the estimated tag life is about 325 days. So we'll estimate about, um, about a year out. Survi we'll estimate survival when they're about a year old and based off of some growth information that we've already obtained, we know that at about a year, those fish are anywhere from like 15 to 17 inches in total length. So we hope that year class strength might already be established at that life stage and there isn't high sources of, of mortality at that time. So I am going to pull up another um, um, file here quickly for you. All right, sorry about that. I had a little problem here. Um, 
One of the other assessments that we are um, using to determine success are juvenile set line assessments in Maumee Bay. And um, the goal of this work is to determine the contribution of Maumee River stocked uh, fish in the western basin of Lake Erie. So we use set lines at 18 different locations. We use uh, hooks and all the fish that we capture identified to species um, and we collect other biological information as well. 2017 to 2019, so we've done this survey for three years now and we've captured zero sturgeon, but we didn't intend or we didn't think we would capture any sturgeon yet from this project because we knew that our hooks did not select for the size of sturgeon um, that would be um, from the Maumee River stocking event. So actually the first year that we thought the sturgeon from the Maumee River stocking events would have been big enough to be captured on our set lines was the fall of 2020. Unfortunately, we were not able to get out and sample in the fall of 2020. And so we're hopeful that in the fall of 2021, when we do this survey again, that we capture some juvenile fish and start looking at trends of these juvenile uh, fish over time stocked fish over time. Another way that we're looking at um, the, the, the stocking events and evaluating success is by working with commercial fishermen. So we're working with the Ohio Division of Wildlife and commercial fishermen. Um, we're giving them a, a box that contains a pit tag scanner, a test tag, a dry erase board, and scale envelopes or, or envelopes to put tissue samples in. Um, when commercial fishermen capture a lake sturgeon in one of their trap nets as bycatch, they take a picture of that fish uh, next to the dry erase board so we can use the dry erase board as a calibration tool to determine length. Um, right now, we're working with uh, four commercial fishermen and four sturgeon have been recaptured. Um, I think it was one in 2019 and three in 2020 uh, uh, by commercial commercial fishermen. And that's how we're able to tell how, how large these fish are at about one year out. So they're averaging 15 to 17 inches one year after, after release. So I should point out too that an additional two lake sturgeon that were released from the Maumee River events have been recaptured in the Ohio Division of Wildlife um, fisheries assessment. So we've caught six uh, sturgeon from the stocking events to date. And uh, I do know that by talking with Eric Weimer with the Ohio Division of Wildlife, that these juvenile fish are not often encountered by commercial fishermen or by um, in Ohio Division of Wildlife surveys. So we are starting to see an increase in, in juvenile uh, sturgeon catch rates uh, in the western Lake Erie. All right, so for uh, the stocking results, uh, kind of the end of the biological evaluation here, uh, to date, we've only stocked in 2018 and 19. Unfortunately, we were not able to collect eggs in two, 2020 uh, due to COVID-19, uh, but now we've stocked out 17 families. In 2018, there were 3,072 fish, 2019, around 2,800 for a total of uh, 5,865 fish to date. Um, another thing that we take a look at is uh, the percentage of fish that lose their pit tag. So one of the things I should have mentioned earlier on in this presentation is that every fish receives an individual pit tag, a passive integrated transponder tag. So anyone who has a pit tag scanner on their boat, which are most of the, the fisheries um, professionals or agencies conducting work in the lake, they can scan that sturgeon and a unique number will come back. But one of the things we want to make sure is that a lot of those tags aren't lost. So I just like to throw in here some of the um, the tag loss information. So in 2018, we tagged around 3,800 fish and 23 of them lost tags up until two weeks uh, prior to stocking. Um, in 2019, we tagged about 2,000 fish, 12 of them lost tags over a 16-day period. So there's actually a whole other study that we're doing right now evaluating tag loss and whether or not tag loss is, is going to be um, a big issue for this project. We don't expect it to be, um, but it's, it would be good to know when these fish uh, stop uh, potentially shedding. shedding. 
All right, so that was the biological monitoring and evaluation uh, component, kind of the, one of the one of the post stocking, and then the last is just the annual release ceremony. So there, um, this is kind of one of the the best days we have, I guess, each year, and I, I'm pretty sure that the zoo Toledo Zoo would say that as well. Um, in 2018 and 2019, we did have uh, public release events that are. Um, spearheaded by the by the Toledo Zoo, but there's a lot of other booths there by many of the partners and people who are um, um, a part of this uh, project. There's an adopt a sturgeon program where folks can adopt a sturgeon and they can uh, get a unique pit tag number assigned to them. And if that fish is ever recaptured, they'll be notified by the Toledo Zoo. And this picture up here on the upper right was. Uh, a picture that was taken during the first release ceremony where these this these are the people who are lining up in order to adopt a sturgeon and be a part of of this event which turned out to be the 2018 stocking event was the first lake sturgeon stocking event that took place in Lake Erie so I know we were pretty excited about that um, and uh, a lot of the a lot of the partners all right, so uh, for more information on this project, uh, you can contact myself, uh, Justin Shiat, Eric Weimer with the Ohio DNR, and Matt Cross. I mentioned all of their names uh, throughout the presentation, so feel free to contact them to learn more about specific aspects of the project. You can also Google or YouTube Toledo Zoo Maumee River Lake Sturgeon, or also Google Maumee River Lake Sturgeon Restoration Program, um, and you will find videos of release events and possibly even other presentations of this project um, that have been given at other other venues. So thank you uh, for allowing me to uh, speak today and that's it.